Yeah, thank you so much. That was so powerful. And after hearing both you and Gary, it's really hard to follow. <laughs> um, I, I'm talking about the Constitutional Convention, and I I do not have a personal connection to this the Constitutional Convention of 1978. I wasn't even born or a, a thought. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I want to talk about some of the sources that we've been using. Um, I'll tell a little bit about our ongoing oral history project, and then maybe if, if we have time, um, share like a brief clip of some of those interviews um, that are not available yet, but we're hoping to, to get those out sometime next year. Um, so... Um, so, like I said, this is an ongoing project that we are conducting at the Center for Oral History. We have um, completed eight interviews so far. Uh, it's kind of been on hiatus because of the um, ongoing pandemic. So for the past one and a half or more years, we, we haven't been doing interviews for this project. Uh, we're hoping to resume them in the spring and conclude with about an additional five interviews. Uh, and this project is being led by Gerald Cotto and Colin Moore at um, UH Manoa. Uh, so I, I've been assisting them in outreach and um, filming these interviews mostly. And uh, the goal of this project is really to document the Constitutional Convention through the delegates who participated uh, because this was such a, a monumental thing to Hawaii's state constitution and um, considering the backgrounds of the delegates, most of them, it was their first foray into politics and many went on to be really influential political leaders. So really um, documenting the stories of the remaining delegates and some of the um, themes that our project has been looking at are like involvement in the Congo, how these individuals came to be involved in the Congo and what led them or inspired them to, to run for election. Um, leadership styles or prominent leaders in the CONCON, uh, Native Hawaiian rights, land and water rights, the initiative referendum and recall, and um, kind of their legacies. Like what did being involved in the CONCON mean for these individuals and their career paths? So um, some of the resources, and um, I can share this, uh, slideshow with Shannon and Devin later, um, and maybe you can add some of these links directly into the Padlet, but um, the Hawaii State Constitutional Convention Clearinghouse is a website de dedicated to um, CONCON, <laughs> and there's a lot of great resources on it for any students or teachers wanting to do more research into this. Um, one of the, the only primary documents for the 1978 CONCON on this site is the proceedings um, to the CONCON, and that's the second bullet point here. Um, but the this clearinghouse also has a list of a lot of secondary sources, like a lot of um, news articles that were uh, about the CONCON. Um, other sources we looked at are, are like a list of the ballot measures, and then um, there's this other source that was the um, referenda and primary election materials that kind of showed each um, uh, referenda and like the votes for, for them. And then also in Ulu Ulu, uh, there were two main ones, I, I think, uh, both kind of news reports of uh, the CONCON. Um, so, so those are some of the things that we've been looking at. And um, just to share, uh, a clip really briefly of um, kind of looking at the diplomacy side of um, debate and diplomacy. Uh, this clip I'm going to share is um, a compilation of um, some of the individuals we've interviewed so far. And um, it, it kind of talks about the leadership style behind um, the con con. So let me play that for you. Again, most of the people that were there were there with a passion and there with a concern or an idea or multiple ideas. 
but also willing to listen. I, I, it was one of those moments that was truly what I would call a democratic gathering, so, so that you could have the hard discussions, you could challenge each other, you could say, yeah, but what about? With anybody, you got to hear them out, hear them out. And then you start asking them questions. And you really steer the ship a little bit more in your direction. That's about the way I spent most of my time, really half the time, a good part of the time anyway, uh, resolving issues between the delegates themselves. At first I was intimidated. I said, hey man, this guy is sugar, you know? We have on sugar. They got enough already. But after I met him and got to know him, wow, what a gentleman. What a gentleman. And his mission was not to protect sugar, was to make the Hawaii a better place. You know? And he did that as much as he could. What in particular impressed you about Bill Katie? His willingness to share, his willingness to listen. You know, His policy was he never closed his door. As president of the uh, Khan Khan, the door is always open. He, would, he could walk in at any time, and he would listen to you. You know, he wouldn't necessarily agree with you. He'd necessarily follow what you suggested, but he would listen. You know, so that I felt comfortable. And then when you know when he tied in with the other individuals like Frenchy De Soto, John Wahe, and they were not interested in protecting sugar, they were not interested in protecting labor at the utmost. They're trying to find balance and pushing the Hawaiian agenda. So I, I felt very comfortable with it. He is a good man. Yeah. Getting, getting, getting uh, recognizing Oha uh, was what was key to the whole thing. And uh, I had always, I had always had a strong relationship with a, you might say, Hawaiian group. And uh, it, 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 it just all fell into place. The Khan Khan set a new direction for Hawaii. And Hawaiian issues had to lead the, the benefits of uh, Khan Khan because they reshaped the Hawaiian uh, culture. You know, the language, gathering rights, Hawaiian homelands. Yeah, so um, there's like a, a preview of, of some of our interviews and it really shows how um, these Hawaiian issues were really central to um, success of the Khan Khan and um, also shows the value of, of oral history as a, a tool of historical inquiry. Um, the, these stories are, are really um, valuable and precious. And um, one thing uh, was that we were really fortunate that we were able to interview um, Bill Patey before he passed away. That interview was conducted actually a, a few months before he passed away. Um, and he was still really sharp. Um, and uh, although you could tell like he, he was definitely old during the interview, he, he had a clear memory of, of the events and um, yeah, thanks to oral history, we, we were able to um, get a lot of the details of Kong Khan and his leadership um, during the Constitutional Convention. Um, but yeah, th for, for thinking about diplomacy, um, there really is a, a lesson to be learned from what everyone has been saying and that listening is was really central and, and being open to, to debate, open to new ideas, um, not shutting out the other side, but actually um, really sitting down with people um, to connect with them. And um, yeah, the, so 
unfortunately, I don't think these interviews will be ready for um, History Day this year. But <laughs> in the future, um, these transcripts will be ready. And, and like I said, hopefully next year, next spring, we're hoping to wrap it up. So um, soon. But on Ulu Ulu, I didn't mention this, but there are some interviews uh, from Con Con. I, I think um, Governor Waihe was interviewed and, and his interview is there. Um, and then a few others as well. So if there are students who do want to engage with oral histories and the Con Con, um, I would recommend going to Ulu Ulu uh, to seek out the resources there. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time, so um, I guess I'll end my uh, talk here so that we have a lot more time for discussion. So, mahalo. Thank you so much, Micah and Viviana and Gary. So uh, that we all they all presented, we will open it up for questions and answers. So.